الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يحفظه قولي وبعد الحمد لله Last week we covered quite a few different topics including the talaq of the the talaq of uh, the person um, the talaq in writing and talaq in sign language and the uh, issuing or uh, uh, talaq of in writing and talaq in sign language yes and we spoke about you know um, the the fourth window through which we looked at to understand talaq and we said that this is based upon how immediate the effect of talaq is is it immediate munjiz or is it muallaq where it's conditioned and attached to a condition a situation that may arise in the future or is it mudaf i.e it's just attached to not on a, 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 another action or another um, another occurrence is just attached to a future time so mudaf say for example that in the beginning of next month the beginning of next year and etc but muallaq is more to do with if this happens then you are if you do this then you are if i do this then you are and so on like that so we've understood that so now inshallah we have a clear picture of you know um how uh, you know looking at the talaq in few different perspectives four different windows number one based upon the damage it does to the aqd it could be raj, raj'i or ba'in bayna sughra or kubra and then number two based upon the time it's given time of the month or the time in which it's given is it given in hayd or is it given in tuhur is it given in one go or is it given you know talaq talaq slowly sort of talaq by talaq over three separate months or just given one by you know by in talaq the the time in which is given that de- that defines if it's sunni or bid'i then we looked at the language itself is it clear and direct or is it indirect if it's clear and direct then it's called sarih and if it's indirect then it's called kinaya and lastly we looked at if it is immediate munjiz if, is the talaq being issued for immediate effect or is it being issued for a future uh, occurrence a future muallaq to a different action or mudaf to a future time today and then we started talking about also you know um, the conditions of the mutalliq the conditions of the one that's giving the talaq shurutul mutalliq the one who's actually giving talaq what are the preconditions that he must meet in order to be able to give talaq in an accepted way that his talaq is going to be valid number one he has to be baligh Number two, he has to be he obviously because we're talking about mutalliq, okay? He has to be baligh, he has to be aqil. Aqil meaning he's intellectually stable, he's not in a, in, in a, in a situation of, you know, um, a mental unawareness. Uh, and he has to be mukhtar optionally and himself choosing to give the talaq. He's not forced, coerced to give the talaq. These are some of the conditions of tal- the mutalliq himself, the one that's actually giving the talaq. Um, we said that Abu Hanifa rahmatullah alayhi and his companions, his, the, the Ashab of the Hanafiya Madhab have said that even if someone is not mukhtar and is mukrah, then his talaq may still be valid. But I don't want to go into that because it's just a bit unnecessarily complicated for us, for this basic class. Um, so, uh, but in summary, uh, in summary, uh, what we understand is that it's balig, uh, haqil and mukhtar. I've got, uh, I'm, I'm smiling because I can see a little note here. It says, you can do it. And I think it's my own handwriting that I wrote for myself in my exam times. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Yeah, this, this, this topic was quite complicated because towards the end, especially with talaq and the types of, um, uh, the, the types of, uh, uh, you know, when you, um, the fasq, the types of fasq. Talaq is quite easy because you've got bain, bain na sughra, you know, raj'i, bain na kubra and all of the different kinaya and stuff like that that comes into play. But when you come to fasq, there's a bit more to it, talaq al-mal, you know, the, condi- the grounds upon which you can see, uh, the woman can seek uh, divorce and all of that, inshallah, will come to very, very shortly, inshallah. So that's that. Um, now we come to, because, and so basically, someone who's mentally unaware, the talaq is not going to be, the talaq is not going to be accepted. Someone who's not, who's mentally unaware, majnoon, you know, um, then his talaq is not going to be accepted. Now from this majnoon issue, there are some other issues that come out. Some fuqaha have put the person who is sakran, drunk, and connected it to someone who is mentally unaware. Because in both cases, what's the similarity? 
they are both mentally unaware, not in charge and not in control of what they say and do. But the first one, where someone is majnoon, mentally unaware, it's out of their control. They don't cause themselves to become drunk or mentally unaware. But in the second scenario, where someone has excessive alcohol and makes himself drunk, then they have induced it upon themselves. So, but the end effect is more or less, or you can say it's similar. It's not the same, but it's similar, whereby someone has no control and charge over what they are doing or what they are saying. Of course, him drinking is the sin, and his, you know, his ta'zir and his punishment of the dunya and the akhirah is there for that. But we're talking about once he is in that state, if he then, while, give, while being drunk, gives a talaq, then is that talaq considered a talaq or not? So this is a mas'ala that has come up now, which is uh, the talaq of the sakran. The jumhur of the fuqaha, which means the mass majority of the fuqaha, have said that he has himself caused him uh, self to be drunk. And so for him to now have a leeway to say, oh, I was drunk, and then I gave talaq as well, he is doing something haram, and then embarking upon something that's the most disliked to all of the halal things, affecting and impacting you know, his marriage and his family and his children, and then for us to say, okay, that talaq is also, uh, you know, it's not valid, we'll make excuses for you, then this is not right. And so therefore the talaq is occurring and the talaq will take place because he himself has induced the, the sakran, the level of sakran and the junoon, if you like, the level of unawareness upon himself. It was not a natural consequence. It was not like it was out of his own control. He could control, he could stop drinking. He could stop drinking, but he didn't, he, choose, he chose to become drunk. So therefore, if he then does whatever he does, he must be made, made responsible. He, might, he must be made responsible for his actions because if we make excuses for that person, then what's going to happen? It's going to be an encouragement. You know, if someone, for example, is drunk and then they go and stab someone or kill someone, like, oh, he was drunk, so let's let him be. It's not a good enough excuse. Even in ka, you know, kuffar countries, non-Muslim countries, while you're being drunk, if you go and attack somebody, abuse somebody, harass somebody, it's not acceptable. You know, that, being drunk does not justify wronging somebody else. So Jumhur al fuqaha have said that the talaq of the sakran is valid and it will be impactful. And if he gives one talaq, it will be one talaq. If, if he gives more, it will be more. Okay. However, some fuqaha, and he doesn't actually list to us exactly whom, but he says some fuqaha, have said that it would not occur because the end effect, the situation that he is in, in the first situation, yes, he was, he did not come away, come to his level of unconsciousness or you know mental unawareness. Maybe it was in his own doing. In this instance, when he was drunk, it was because of his own doing. But in the end of the day, the effect is similar, whereby they are both not fully in control of what they're doing. And so some fuqah have said that the talaq will not be impacted not be valid and because of this reason it is you know whenever it's an issue of talaq it's very important that you go to a very qualified mufti someone who's had lots of experience with these issues and explain everything everything has to become clear you know who are you what's your background who is she what's her background what kind of you know what kind of personality do they have children family all of the different variables come into place and so the mufti and the one that you're asking you know if that from you're doing istifta from they will be able to get a clear picture and then see which fatwa is most suitable for you everything has to be clear and so you know do, dealing with talaq is very complex and very complicated and a lot of the times when i get questions about talaq as well i try to i always consult with others before i say anything if it's something very basic then of course i can say a basic answer like for example if someone says you know how do i divorce my wife you know i can spelled out for you but if say for example i've said in this particular way, i'll always go and consult with other mashayikh and a lot of the times i will say do you know what yes this has happened and this is what i think it is but you should still go to a sharia council to get a clear uh, reference because you'll have a body of scholars um, who have you know sort of who are who have a who are representing an institution and you should get a their final hukum on the issue uh, because there are so many variables that can uh, take be taken into uh, taken into consideration, and uh, I benefit from uh, I benefited a lot from a friend of mine who works who worked uh, uh, for a period of time in the Daru al Ifta al Misriya, the Egyptian Fatwa Council. He was working there, 
actually I had a few friends that, that were sort of you know experiencing there volunteering there or you know sitting with the mashaykh as they give their fatwa um, when people come and ask for their family situation they're listening they're listening and they're understanding from them what, how do you do, why did you come to this hukum and this person was different and this person is different what's all of this and so from that you understand you know fiqh is all about the deep understanding taking into each and every single ahwal and hala shakhsiyya individually and giving the hukum based upon that so it's very quite a sophisticated issue especially talaq and nikah is very easy you know qabil tu qabil tuha and it's done you know mashallah and dua and khajur and you know all the events but talaq is a, a bit more complicated and so it should definitely be run through mashayikh before it's actually uh, before it's actually uh, stamped upon or you know uh, dealt with uh, he's saying here um, even though the opinion even though the opinion of uh, uh, the one, the fuqaha that say the talaq of the sakran, the drunk person, uh, is still valid. His talaq is done. He said, even then, the Egyptian qanun and the Egyptian law has taken that opinion, whereby if someone is drunk and gives talaq, okay, then looking at the particular scenario, they may well say that this person's talaq is not valid. Why? Because, why? Because, again, to look at the overall situation of the country, how families run, the economic situation, if you divide a family, what happens then, what happens to the kids, you know, the, the impact that it has in the, on, in the entirety of the family, the community and the society makes it, you know, the situation changes, it could become a darura, it could become a haja, so maybe in that situation, taking a weaker opinion may be valid, may be acceptable, and again, that would be run by and done by and issued by a mufti uh, who's uh, qualified and authorized to do so. There's another issue, so that was the talaq of the sakran. But we say, Jamhur of the Fuqaha, mass majority, you chose to go and get drunk, then you gave talaq, your talaq is done. Finished. Your talaq is done and your wife will be divorced. That is the opinion of the Jamhur and the stronger opinion, and that's the opinion that we'll go by and we'll stand by. Okay? And unless you go to a mufti and you find an exceptional circumstance and that mufti allows you otherwise. The next one is the talaq of someone who's joking. Oh, I gave talaq as a joke. I oh, divorce you, ha ha ha. It's not funny. Because there's a hadith that's been narrated and it's sahih by a Tirmidhi Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, Thalathun jidduhunna haddun uh, uh, jidduhunna jidd wa hazluhunna jidd al nikah wa talaq wa al-itaq. Three things in which the joke is a is a serious the joke is also taken seriously and the seriousness of it is also taken seriously i.e. in all situations there's no jokes about it and those three things are if you marry someone as a joke if you say to someone oh you know i i proposed to you in marriage with a mahar of 500 pounds and these are my witnesses and she says i accepted you then it's done it's done you were, i was joking well you proposed witnesses were there and you know she also accepted and she was especially if she was someone who doesn't need wali i.e someone who's been married before the one who was married before generally they don't need wali uh, except for some schools of course they they require wali nonetheless or a talaq as well oh i divorce you it's not funny at all if you joke about it she's divorced and also at the time of when slave, slavery was around if someone as a joke said oh i free you from slavery and they own that slave then that would also be taken seriously and that would be the end of the ownership of that slave so therefore, joking about these things are no, no joking matter. They're no uh, light matter. It should be taken seriously. And you should never joke about these things, uh, uh, divorce especially. And you should also never joke about another thing that a lot of these, I don't know, childish men, they joke about is, you know, polygamy. They don't, they don't have no, no plan, no ability, no intention, no, you know, no real ability to even uh, think about or consider polygamy. And yet, they will sometimes you know, annoy their wife with it. Oh yeah, I'm gonna, this is not good. Why, why are you doing this? You're causing someone distress for no reason. Especially if you know that it's gonna cause them distress and your intention is to cause them distress. You might say, well, it's halal for me. Well, it's not halal for you to cause distress, is it? It's not halal for you to offend someone, to upset somebody when you're not actually gonna go and do that. If, if it was, if it is halal for you and you find a legitimate, correct, According to the Sunnah way, with, through justice and through proper, you know, attitude and you know, proper in a proper way, then that's a separate issue. You know, we're we're talking about taking the mic and making a joke out of it. This should never be done. This is a very very important piece of advice for all of us, for everybody. So we've spoken about so far talaq of sakran, 
and talaqul hazil, the talaq of the joker, the joker who gives talaq. Now we have talaq of al ghadban that Hajj Khalil was referring to last time. Remember, I said to you that when it comes to mental awareness and mental ability, that's taken into consideration. The Sharia says if somebody is mentally unaware and mentally not in control of their actions, then in that situation, that rufi al qalamu an thalath, that the pen or the responsibility has been lifted from three people or three groups of people, the child until it becomes baligh, and the na'im and the sleeping person until they wake up, if someone says in their sleep, it doesn't matter, and the person who is mentally unaware until they become aqil again, until they come back to their senses again. So ghadab, anger, is normally not an excuse. But we have situations where people, because of their anger, they completely lose control of their actions. They can't differentiate between man and woman. Black and white, they can't. They, I, I heard people say this like, when I get angry, my eyesight becomes blurry, I can't see properly. That's the level of anger we're talking about. These people have got a mental, you know, anger management issue. Anger management issue. And so, here we need to see if someone who has given talaq in a state of anger does he fall into? Can he be? Can he be categorized? And would a doctor? sit there and say, yeah, this person has got such an anger issue that they have no control over their actions. We'll have to verify it from a reliable medical person. We can't just, oh, you know, we can't just take your word for it because then anybody will say, oh yeah, I was angry. Well, one of the things that a lot of people do say, which is valid for, for the most part, well, no one really gives talaq when they're happy. Well, it's true. People usually do give talaq when they're angry, but it's also true that sometimes people very calmly and very decisively come to a conclusion that they want to have a divorce. So it's not like no one gives a divorce while they're not angry. It's not like every divorce is because of anger. No, that's not true <coughs> at all. And so, talaq al ghadban the talaq of the, the angry man, is it valid or is it not? It depends. It depends if he can be put into the category of someone who has got some sort of a schizophrenia or whatever other medical term you may have for it. Then in that case, if we can say that he has no control over his action because of his mental condition, then his talaq will not be. Otherwise, for the most of us, for the rest of us, for more than 90% perhaps of us, you know, who don't have these kind of conditions, yes, we get angry and this anger is not an excuse. Just like you can't go and get angry and start hitting somebody and abusing somebody and say, oh, I was angry. Unless you have a mental health condition, do you see? So sometimes you hear someone's done a, a, some sort of an attack, but if they are found to be mental health people or condition, you know, then or stuff like that, then, then they are often given a lighter or no sentence at all. Um, uh, anyway, nonetheless, the point is that we need to see the situation and case by case individually. It's not for us to decide what is taking information here so that we have we have an understanding. But as for the, the, the application of talaq and the giving of the hukum and the ruling and the fatwa, that will be upon the mufti. And now we come to the fourth issue, the talaq of the marid, the talaq of the ill person. Well, it's not really, a bit, it's not too complicated. If you're unwell, then you still have rights to make decisions about your family, uh, about yourself. If someone is unwell, they can decide, for example, that I want to uh, buy this, I want to sell that, I, I want to, I want to, uh, you know, I want to see my wife, or I want to see that child of mine. So, talaqul marid, a normal ill person, that's not the person that we're talking about. We're talking about the person who is unwell and that illness is going to lead to their death. Someone who has terminal cancer, for example, that kind of illness. Someone who's reached an old age and we know that this kind of, these are symptoms of that person nearing death, you know. And in cultures, according to experienced people, elders, even cultures, doctors, they will be able to see that this person is, even though Allah may add a few more months, a few more years to their umur and to their age, but you can tell that this person is deteriorating and they're going towards. This is called maradul maut, the illness that leads to death. So now, if someone, if it was not this kind of illness, any other illness, if someone's got a temperature, someone's got any other illness, it doesn't matter, it's not leading sort of, you know, with guarantee or almost certainly to their, death, to their death, then it doesn't really matter. They can do whatever they want. They can buy, they can sell, uh, they, can, they can get married, they can divorce. It's up to them. It's not a problem because they are still able to make their own decisions because they haven't been impacted in their mind. They, they have the authority over them, over their life and their, and their, and their affairs. 
But if someone is in such an unwell condition that this is, they're going to die from it, or you can see signs they will die from it, or they actually do in fact die from it thereafter, so afterwards in hindsight it becomes clear that they were actually dying from that illness, then there are certain rules of Sharia that come into play. For example, the person, how much money he can spend from his inheritance is also taken into consideration. Is he giving all of his money away all of a sudden? Why is he doing that? And he's extremely unwell. So Sharia will come in and put in certain barriers, say, you can't spend more than this, you can't spend more than that, because then you will harm your inheritors. So similarly, if someone who is in a state of maradul maut, they are in a terminally unwell condition, whereby they will die from it, most likely, and then all of a sudden, voluntarily, the wife hasn't asked for a divorce, nor has she done anything to him, um, you know, to cause that divorce, all of a sudden he's voluntarily giving her divorce, then this divorce will not be, will not be impactful because this could be because he's running away or he's trying to stop her from inheriting. Do you see? So because there's, a, there's rights of inheritance come into play, when someone is in the state, state of maradul maut, uh, the illness that will take someone to their death, uh, you know, there are sometimes his decisions are limited so that others' rights may be preserved. So this is again amazing. It's, it's one of the amazing things about Sharia and, and you know, the wisdom of Sharia and the fact that Allah knows us and lo knows what we need and our needs of our life and Akhirah. Again, these are, I'm just giving you pictures of what can possibly happen. Individual cases will be discussed by in individual scenarios and this is not, you know, this is not the ultimatum. This is not the ultimatum. Um, this is especially if he is in a maradul maut, he is in a, a terminally unwell condition and is given a ba in talaq, a ba in talaq, you know, the separative talaq, the irrevocable talaq. Then we'll know, whoa, something's going on here a bit strange. Maybe he is trying to prevent her from inheriting. But if it's a raj'i talaq, like where he can revoke her, then we can see that maybe something, will, every situation will be taken into consideration. Because in raj'i talaq, even if it is a raj'i talaq, revocable talaq, she's still your wife. So she will still inherit from you. But if it's ba'in talaq, then she will not inherit from you. So this has to be taken with caution. And the, and the relevant people in that community should, should take that into consideration. Um, uh, okay, and that's that. There is some ikhtilaf slightly here, but I'm not going to bring it into here because, because it's going to make it more complicated. So we've, we've spoken so far about the talaq of the sakran, the drunk person, the talaq of the person who is joking, the talaq of the ghadban, the talaq of the marid, maradul maut, the one who's unwell, terminally unwell. And now we will come to, before we said, the conditions of the al mutalliq, the one who's giving the talaq. Now conditions of the one who is receiving the woman that's being given talaq to. There are some conditions, of course. You can't just go around and give talaq to anybody. <laughs> yeah, there are certain conditions of the person who you're giving talaq to have to be met. Okay, so from them is that she has to be eligible to receive talaq. She has to be married to you. You can't just go and give talaq to random people. She has to be your wife. Okay, so she has to be your wife, really. حقيقةً أو حكمًا. So what's حقيقةً? That she has not been given any talaq. So she's actually still your wife. Or that she's been given a raj'i talaq. That's حكمًا. That's technically. She's really your wife. In realist, she's 100%, you know, with no, no complications, no confusions. She's your wife, meaning you have never given, uh, you haven't given her a divorce. But if you've given her a raj'i talaq, then this talaq, even though it's a talaq, and it may seem like, oh, we're not actually married, but technically you're still connected in marriage because that's a revocable talaq. And so therefore she has to be mahallan, hukman, uh, that she has to be, uh, she has to be mahallan lit talaq, she has to be eligible and possible for her to even receive talaq, meaning she is your wife. Um, uh, right, and, and, and this, is, this is very important And there's another point here But I'm not going to go into that Okay, so from the conditions is that um, from, the, well, from the primary condition Is that she has to be your wife What are situations And there's a bit here But I don't want to go into it too much What are وَعَلَى ذَلِكْ فَلَا يَقَعُ الطَّلَقْ There are some situations in which talaq may not occur You may give the talaq But it may not occur what are they? For example, when the talaq has already been given three times. Or that the talaq has been given in a marriage which wasn't actually done properly. The, the, the marriage itself, the contract was fasid. The contract itself was fasid. Okay? So the point being is, if you want, 
if, if somebody is to issue a talaq to their wife, then they have to be eligible to receive the talaq, i.e. They have, they have to be in a marriage. If, however, you're giving talaq in excess of three, then they can't issue more than that. If your marriage wasn't conducted properly in the first place, then you, there's no talaq to give. Okay, so these are some of the things to take into consideration and there's a bit more sort of details here But I don't want to go into that and that, Now we move on, we're moving now on to the next section which is called Anwa'u Furaq al-Nikah The situation, in the situations in which the marriage may be separated without talaq Situations in which uh, marriages may be separated without talaq And I suggest that we start, we start this new afresh from next time What do you think? We covered four issues today, okay, even though it wasn't much time, but these are four quite important issues. And inshallah, let that settle, revise a little bit perhaps, and next time we'll go into the types of separ separations of marriage which are initiated by the bride, by the wife, and not the husband. So we're basically going to the other side, where the talaq is given by the wife. Okay, uh, And you will see in that section how Islam has preserved the rights uh, women's rights if you like you know how even though initially the ability to give talaq instantaneously has been given to the man to the husband the Sharia has still of course left many grounds upon which the woman may easily and should be able to easily seek out to divorce herself if she's in a harm if she's being harmed if she's been abused if she doesn't want to be in the marriage because of any other difficulty that's being imposed upon her again and again this is very important to study because a lot of the times what happens is when people uh, think and are misinformed that talaq is only you know only the man can give talaq and you can't give him a talaq because you don't have any choice in it what does it do does it help them or does it harm them it actually harms them because on the one hand it harms them of course emotionally harms them mentally or the lot of the times and it even harms their iman sometimes you think well this iman islam is not fair islam is not fair it's not giving me my rights how can only do you see so that's because we don't we're not teaching it fairly we're not teaching it fairly and we're not seeing, we're not showing that yes, you may also, yes, if you want to separate from your husband, yes, you may do so. These are the steps. And you want to separate from your wife, from your wife Mr. Husband, then you may do so. These are the steps.